I'd like to start by asking a question to all of you. How much do you think our economy should grow? Would 5% be a good number? What the media is telling us, they start the economy and go back to consumption and growth. So I'm going to talk about that tonight. Is growth sustainable? First off, I want to point out that growth is not the same as prosperity. And yet this is something that we've been told for a long time in our life. Growth comes from surplus. Surplus is abundance. And when we, we've had so much abundance in the past, so many natural resources that we could grow and have prosperity. Let's have an example of this. Let's say an average family of four makes $40,000 a year. And they spend every dollar of that. The next year they get a 10% raise. And with that raise they have 4,000 extra dollars. Now they could choose to have another child. That's growth. And they could afford that with that extra $4,000. Or there's four of them. They could take that $4,000 and turn that into an extra $1,000 each to, to do different things. That's prosperity. So growth is not the same as prosperity. It comes from a surplus. Let's take a growth example here. Let's start off with a, a small population of 1 million people and a measly growth rate of 1%. From that 1 million to reach 1 billion people takes almost 700 years. But the second billion is not 700 years, it's 100 years. And if you look at these numbers, 41 for the next billion, 29, 22, and the final six billion there happens in 18 years. And that's what the 1% growth curve. Continuous growth compounded results in an exponential function. What I want to point out here is the exponential function is a speeding up. If you've noticed, we basically have a society where everything seems to be getting faster. So this is population. This is our world today. The green curve right here represents current history. We've gone all of these years growing at a very steady rate, and now we've turned this curve. And even though the growth rate hasn't gone up, it's compounding, and it has hit this exponential state. If you look at the red there, that's UN projection for the next 40 years. We're almost going to double the amount of people. And this gray line up there, that's about the maximum that uh, you know, scientists say that the Earth can possibly sustain. And that's at a great cost to the Earth as well. Put these numbers into perspective. Let's look at these different countries, all right? China. Everybody knows China is a hugely populated country. It has 1.3 to 1.6 billion people in it. Take the US. The US is 300 million, or 0.3 billion. Another way of saying this is the US is a rounding error of China's population. And that's how small we are. So you can just imagine what China's population is. And if you haven't been there, I highly suggest going. If you look at the top five US cities as far as population goes, if you add all of them together, it is still smaller than the top largest Chinese city. Now, every year, 70 million people are being added to this earth right now. 70 million. That's three times the largest you know, city in China. It's three times the largest 10 cities of the US. So we've got the ecology. We've got our economy. We have our society. And they all intersect. How do they intersect? Obviously, we have shortages of things. We have a certain amount, a limited amount, of natural resources. We allocate those natural resources through economics, which is basically satisfying our unlimited wants and, and desires for those finite resources. I'm sure if we all could, we'd love to live the life of billionaires, but it's just not possible, and that's what economics divvies out for us. So this is the growth curve of money. Notice it's an exponential function. This is the US money supply. This is the years from 
only 1960, and as the U.S. economy has been growing, and the money supply has been growing between 8 to 15 percent a year. And again, we're hitting an exponential function. It took over 300 years for us to create one trillion dollars in the U.S. It only took four and a half months to create the last trillion. It's very important when we talk about money that we understand what money is. Money is issued as debt. Money is created when we take out loans from the bank. And those loans have to be repaid with interest. The federal government prints money and then issues it as bonds, which they pay interest on. That interest is a requirement of growth. You have to have growth to pay the interest. So your money supply must grow every year at minimum the enough to equal the amount of interest due. That's a key concept. Growing debt levels imply that the future will be larger than the past in order to repay them. Now, this is where we're at right now. 340% of GDP, or gross domestic product, is owned in credit markets right now. It's at a historic high. And if you look here, there, there's actually back in around 1929 with the Great Depression, we see it actually went up quite a bit there. That, that's a little bit deceiving. The debt in the Roaring Twenties, there was a lot of debt issued before that. But what you see in that spike is the Depression. That's when the economy literally fell away from the loans. The loans remained, but the economy collapsed. And that's why that's high. So that's a little anomaly, but we are at 340%. And if you look here, the historical average is never over 200%. We've seen population. We've seen money. Now, oil is a very important component of this because it provides the ability to create the population and the money. This is a correlation here between GDP, the world's output, and oil. If you look, they follow each other very closely. In fact, energy is directly related to the amount of products that we can create. And oil is our number one energy source. In fact, it provides over 50% of all energy. If you look at natural gas and oil together, it provides over 75% of all our energy. These are non-renewable resources. This is Dubai in 1990. This is Dubai in 2007. You can just see the change in cities. Not only does it take energy, but it also takes resources. So I'm going to talk about resources right here. This is a resource extraction profile. And basically what it means is at the beginning, you have easy to get resources. And at the end, you have harder to get resources. And they cost more and require more energy to get. An example of this is copper. In this picture, we have two miners, and they're sitting on a copper nugget. I mean, that was just sitting there. That's a huge amount of copper. Then we went to copper ores, and those are about 10%. This is uh, the Bingham mine in Utah. This is a copper mine. What I want you to notice is this is three quarters of a mile deep, and it's three miles across. And this used to be a mountain. This is where we're getting our copper from right now. If, if you go, go back here, that's copper just sitting there waiting to be had. This copper right here is 0.2% copper. Only 0.2. I want to point something out. That little arrow right there, that's a truck. That's how big this thing is. See that truck? It carries 250 tons of just rock. If you were doing this you know, with donkeys, for instance, a donkey can carry about 150 pounds. This donkey right here, it would take 3,400 donkeys to equal this truck. That's a lot of donkeys. <laughs> if you look at this curve, it should look familiar. It's an exponential curve. If we start off here at the bottom, it's like one to one, right? You can just pick it up, it's just right there. The lower ore grades that you get to the more energy it takes to get that ore out of the ground. See where we're at right now? That is the Bingham mine in Utah. At 
they have to pull out 500 pounds of rocks to get one pound of copper. That's where we're at. Copper is not alone in this, in these resource profiles. We're hitting this all over with, with so many of our resources, and if we haven't hit it yet, we're going to in the next couple decades. In order to talk about all of these three things, we've got to talk about them together. The economy, energy, and lastly, the environment. We have a finite planet, and these exponential curves are meeting a finite planet. Can we continue to grow wealth in a finite planet? Can our population continue to go up on a finite planet? These are some of the environmental indicators that we're running into right now. This is our water use. The state of California, for instance, 20% of all of their energy use goes to pumping water. A lot of it is groundwater. Over half of the US pumps groundwater. And we've already abandoned millions of acres of farmland because it just costs too much to pump that water. Species extinction. In fact, scientists right now say that we're in the sixth great extinction period. The big difference is that we're the ones that are causing it. We are displacing nature with our growth. Fisheries. 11 out of the 15 major fisheries in the world are currently in collapse. How are we ever going to get those back? Our solution to finding more fish is to send the boats farther and farther out to, to get the rest and the last of the remaining fish. 90% of all of our top predatory fish are gone. The last one, forest loss. We've lost over half of the world's forests already. And the remaining half, they're not doing too well. They're not healthy. It's not just forests. There are so many other things, like topsoil. The last hundred years, we've lost over a third of our topsoil. You could say that farmers are literally mining topsoil. And this is the world that we're living in right now. This is a world of exponential curves. This is the problems and challenges that we face. Our life support resources are declining at an era of increasing consumption. You could say that right now, biology and nature are putting every red light on our dashboard. I know that when I have a red light, I, I pull over, I, I stop, and I try to find out what the problem is. It seems to me like we're just stepping on the gas and going full speed ahead. Now let's go back to economics. Remember, the primary economic assumption with these growth models is that the future will not just be bigger, but exponentially bigger than the present. These are the realities. Our money must grow, and yet our resources can't grow, and they're depleting. And we have energy, which we'll be talking about later, and another speaker. Is growth sustainable? The growth model. Can we kickstart the economy and go back to consumption and growth? And I see people shaking their heads. That's exactly right. First, it is ridiculed. Second, it is violently opposed. And third, it is accepted as being self-evident. I right, thank you very much.